Welcome to the Donna Sebo Show. Donna is an international mental practitioner, psychic, award-winning author, counselor, speaker, teacher, and radio television talk show personality. She brings to the airwaves talented people from around the world who share their insights and experiences with you, the listening audience. Now, let's join Donna. Hello and welcome. Wherever you are on this magnificent planet of ours, I'm so delighted you're able to join me. Donna Sebo here with my guest, Jean Walters, and we're going to be talking about the universe. Yes. Now, we're going to be approaching it from a metaphysical positioning because Jean, just like me, believes very much that we each have a potential for not just greatness, but for being able to be open and receptive to what is already within us and living life with not just a sense of purpose, but also having joy, being able to take each moment as a gift and live life that has a richness to it that other people are going to look at you and say, I want to know what you're taking so that I can have (laughs) some of it. Jane Walters, I want to welcome you to the show. Oh, thank you, Don. I'm so happy to be here. I look forward to uh, sharing some great information with you. Well, I'll tell you what, Jean. You are a woman that has been very, very dedicated to empowering people. And this is something that I think anyone who is a teacher, anyone that has achieved a level of mastery, no matter what it might be, They always want to pass it on, or typically they always want to pass it on, because they realize that when they do, it's empowering someone else, and that person is perhaps going to surpass them, and they're not going to be concerned about that, but they want to empower those individuals that are willing to listen to be the best that they can be. And that's what your book, Deep Truth, Wisdom of the Masters, Reality and Illusion, is all about about and it's quite a read you, you oh, i'm glad you said that it, it it was quite a joy to write it yes now you because there's people in my audience that are not going to be familiar with eugene you've been involved in this work for how long i've been involved with this work for most of my life uh, well over 40 years and i've always from the time i was a little kid i was curious i wanted to know i i had so many questions and really, there weren't that many people that I could ask them of, you know. Mm-hmm. But the universe has always been and supplied me with somebody that could be a guide of some sort. And, of course, we all have these uh, masterful people, you know, the Einsteins and the Edisons and the, all these wonderful people that we can read about and understand some of the truth that they formulated. And, and that's that's something we can all apply and that's what my work is about. I, I'm about application, putting it into practice, using it in your own laboratory, which is yourself, and then you know, and then making it part of your 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 way in life. Because I think we can all live joyful lives, mm-hmm. and it seems a shame not to. I agree. For so many of us, and I'm I'm including myself in the group. Dependent on what our environment has been, dependent on the belief systems, the cultural environments Mm -hmm. that we're in, we will perhaps be born into a family or into an environment that says, this is black and this is white. Mm -hmm. And it, it really takes, and you mentioned the magic word as far as I'm concerned, a curiosity, a willingness to question. And when you're of that demeanor, Male or female, you're going to find people immediately saying, I don't care what your age is, you have no right to do that. You do not understand that this is black and this is white. And you Mm -hmm. go, well, according to what I found out, there's a little bit of purple thrown in, some yellow, and there may be green. So (laughs) it's more like a rainbow. And it's very difficult sometimes because you want to be accepted, you want to be able to fit, and yet it's like wearing the wrong size of underwear. If it's too <laughs> small, you may only be able to get one leg through one section of it or one arm, and you go, this is not going to work. And we have to be comfortable with that, don't we? Well, I think the idea, though, Donna, is is also 
to, it's not so much that we have to ask questions to everybody else. Sometimes we just ask questions to ourselves because the answers are within. And, uh, you know, I think it's perfectly all right to let people prattle on about their black and white. And then you basically know that you're going to find your own way in the world, in the rainbow world that we all live in. And uh, at some point, everybody has to make that decision that I'm, I don't have to be part of the black and white world anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, I decided that long time ago when I was a kid. I thought I'm never going to be normal. I, and I was so happy about that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you figured out what normal is because so far I haven't figured that one out. I find yeah, there's, I, I, you know, there's so true. much diversity. My goodness, yes. and it's wonderful. I'm so grateful for it. I mean, it gives you something Indeed. to talk about. Well, normal in my world was just the, what you were saying before is like you you do you kind of do this life where you live the picket fence thing and then you know you work until you retire and you know and all of it made no sense to me at all. I couldn't get it, and then I decided just to forget about all that and just just find my way and ask questions and but spend some time with my inner self so that I could really discover truth and that really is the way you do it is you have to go in instead of out we have to go into your inner self instead of always looking outside in the material world because there aren't a lot of answers out there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and there's not often individuals that you can turn to that you can speak honestly, with integrity, and and this, I'm sure, just about everybody can relate. You say, gee, I wish I could talk to my mom, but I can't, because what I do is I get yeah. this happening. Or I wish I could talk to my sister or brother. No, they just, they think I'm nuts. Yeah. So sometimes, and I know I was blessed that way, I had the privilege of meeting the woman that became my mentor for a few years, and I could talk to her about anything. And she yeah. was that. She was my mentor. And Wasn't it that was a beautiful huge. Gift? Yeah. It yes. was huge. And I think many times that's what people are seeking, that mentor, no matter what environment they might be in, whether it's business or music or arts, you know, it doesn't yeah. medicine, it doesn't make any difference. It's finding that person, maybe an environment that allows you to turn on to that part that's inside yourself that is so magical. And well, I start. I actually start the book out that way because I was like 16 years old, and I was about to gra- I was close to graduating high school, and I was feeling pretty uh, depressed about the whole thing because I I couldn't make any sense of what I was supposed to do after that. I mean, just continue learning things that weren't going to be applicable or learning things that that weren't even that interesting. Just could, I couldn't make any sense of it. I couldn't make any sense of just coming home from work and sitting and watching TV. And then, you know, <laughs> I just couldn't make sense of it. And I was talking to my driver's ed teacher when I was 16, and he said, and he drew this circle. And he said, Gene, life is like this circle. And he said, you know, inside the circle is everything you know, and outside that line that goes around the circle is everything you don't know. And he said, look what happens when you expand what you know. The line around the outside grows, too. And that was so exciting to me. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, my gosh, maybe I can do this. Maybe I could do this. <laughs> so, I mean, he was, so I, I feel like people appear when you need them, you know. Now, that was just one conversation I had with him. But I feel like there's always been people that showed up when I needed them. And, and I know that I've, I've done that for others, too. And, and that feels really good because it's like uh, then I'm fulfilling my purpose, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have and I'm a, sure you've felt the same way. Yes, in uh, many you, instances. You've helped others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, and that's something that when I reflect on it, many times it was because I had gone through a certain experience, and it seemed mm-hmm. like someone came into my space, and I would share with them what my experience was, the good, the bad, or the ugly. And I remember one particular one when I was 19, sharing it with a friend, and by golly, that friend, she looked at me, and I said, please learn from me. This is what happened. This is what you need to be aware of. And it mm-hmm. was like I was, an, you know, 150 yeah. years old, and I'm telling her, and I thought, you mean I had to go through that stuff 
so I could share it with her? Well, of course, because I was young. Yeah. I didn't have much experience, but when I got it, it didn't bother me to share it because and it made all the difference in the world to her. All the difference yeah. in the world to yeah. her. And that you were there important. at the right time. Yeah, right. Perfect. And she was there for me to be able to verbalize what I yes. wasn't able to verbalize to someone else. Yeah. So that's very good. Now, you make a sentence a statement in your book. You are a cell in the body of the universe. Yes. Now, that is extraordinarily significant. Yeah. Because it gives an image. Those words give an image. When you look at any of the photos of outer space. It mm-hmm. is huge. And yeah. when you look at yourself in a way like you're a star, look up at the Milky Way and you'll see bazillions of them. Yeah. And you look at it and say, wow, I'm up there. I am one of those twinkles. Yes. That's something. Yeah. Just like a, the snowflake, every snowflake is different and unique. Mm-hmm. And yet we see the huge you know, snow drifts and everything. It's hard to imagine that individuality and uniqueness. But I see us in this quantum field of energy, and, and we are this spark of life in this quantum field. And if we imagine ourselves and identify ourselves as the quantum field instead of the tiny little body that we think we are, that we identify with, then we begin to open up this vast uh, experience and and we be, we can really connect with our true creativity and our authenticity because we are so much bigger than most people realize in every which way you know whether it's our talent our ability our our wisdom our intuitive qualities all of these things are so vast and and i think most people just relate to themselves as a as a body and then and it's so limiting. It's such a limiting concept. It really is very limiting, but it's what we have to work with in this experience. So it's important for us to realize that, you know, this is the way it is for this round. And you go, okay, so how can I be the best I can be? You have- well, Yes, yes, and then, but at the same time, you know, we are not just a body. <laughs> well, that's true. We- yeah, and that's what that's all I'm saying is that um, you know we have a body, but we're not a body. It's like we have a car and we drive it everywhere. It's a vehicle, and it gets us from A to B. But that's the same thing that the body does. And so, if we spend a little bit of time just reflecting inwardly, we can begin to connect more with the the other, the greater concept. You know, the lesser is in the greater, not the other way around. And so the body is in our greater self, which is our, is, which is our, you know, quantum field self, our spiritual self, whatever word you want to use. And then that's when we begin to unlock our creativity and power. Mm-hmm. I liked your description of our being a computer that accepts whatever software program we want to put in it. And this is something that our computer software systems are operating from the time we're born, maybe Mm -hmm. even before then. Mm -hmm. And as adults, now this can happen with children, but typically we don't really start making changes until we're adults because we're looking at things differently depending on our experiences but when you use the analogy of software systems and you say you can delete programs you can edit them you can create new programs and I chuckled with the one sentence you said the original concept of the computer was based on or mirrored the structure of the mind Mm -hmm. and I thought that's that's great and sometimes we need to install some new software and throw out the other system yeah (laughs) <laughs> and that's yeah. not always easy to do because yeah. we are unsure that it's going to work. And that new software has to do with our beliefs and our stories. Right. So do yes. you have an exercise for people to work with that? Throughout your book, yes. you have little exercises that you bring in. They're very simple. And yes. I think it's good. But what would you recommend for someone that says, my software program stinks. In fact, it's crashed. <laughs> what do I do, well, Jean? 
I would say, oh, you're at a great point right now because you just understood something very significant and important. Now I want you to start paying attention to your thoughts and do it for one minute at a time. But notice then all the ways that you are negative or all the ways that you judge a situation and begin to ask yourself the question, is there another way that I could look at that? And then as, as you begin to, to learn how to look at it from different directions, from different ways, from different concepts, you might begin to unlock another way to live life, another way to live life through that particular situation or relationship. And it's like that the Dalai Lama was, to, I, I heard one of his little lectures to his monks and he said, in, in every situation, look at it from many different directions. And I think that was a wonderful piece of advice. But that's what we have to do. We have to don't just assume that what we were taught is correct. It, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. Mm-hmm. And then and then when we begin to challenge these old ways, like we're judging, you know, if we're we, – we judge ourselves to be a, a – Methodist or Presbyterian or a Republican or a, a Hindu or whatever it is, you know, and we make all these judgments and all we do is we just make ourselves smaller because every time we take on a new identity, another identity, we just def- confine ourselves within that. Whereas I'm suggesting in this book that we open ourselves up and begin to drop a lot of that. And we have to challenge it first, you know, is, is there some value to defining ourselves in those small ways? Or can we just be open like a child mm-hmm. and, and say, what, what is that? What is that blue thing that's sitting on that tree out there? What is that? You know, and it's making that noise. What is that? And, and I think that just because we're grown up doesn't mean we can't have that questioning and that wonderment. And that willingness, you know, to just look and see from with different eyes. You bring up something in your book, and of course there's many, many different aspects that you present in your book, Deep Truth, Wisdom of the Master's Reality and Illusion. And we're just going to be touching in our time frame on a few of them, but one of them that I think is very significant, and that has to do with health. And more uh-huh. and more, there is the awareness that physical, physiological conditions, I know because I've experienced it firsthand, mm-hmm. will come from an emotional base. Yeah. And you have an example about a woman who carried so much anger and resentment inside of her, she mm-hmm. ended up having all kinds of cancerous tumors throughout her body. Yes. And you said this is something, it didn't happen overnight. This is something where she did not know how to release all of that. And it stores in the body like arsenic. Yes. And it creates abnormalities. Mm-hmm. So this is something, the mind-body connection, the mind-body-spirit emotional connection is very real. And this yes. often is hard for people to understand. And Louise Hay addressed this many times because she mm-hmm. went through the same thing. And that's why she wrote the book sure. on, on self-healing. And this is what often doctors don't even have the time to even discuss with anyone. You know, what's at the core of what's going wrong in the body. And you say you can't heal the outer and the external, the body, without going to the core of That's whatever right. has been in your life. And oh my goodness, that is so true. I've known so many people, including myself at, at different points in my life, and I would say, what am I, you know, what 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 am I doing here? What has gone on? And yeah, when you get yeah. to the core, you have a chance to turn things around. And this woman, did she ever turn it around? Um I'm I'm trying to remember which one it is. There was one there was one that came to mind while you were talking about it because there's been I've been doing this with people for so long, you know. But there was one woman that was so angry when she was in my office and I said to her, you you, you seem very angry. Uh what's going on? And she, and she said, well, she had to stop and think about it because it was so normal for her mm-hmm. <laughs> that she wasn't even thinking she was. And then she said, I'm really mad at my husband. 
he died, and uh, we we had this agreement that we would be together until we, to forever, you know, whatever, whatever the agreement was. And and he he left, he left me, and and then we talked a little bit about it and and what what another way to look at that, another way to to realize, you know, that he was in a lot of pain, and it was, is that what she wanted for him? Or I don't remember. We we kind mm-hmm. of approached it from different angles. What happened was her body was in so much pain, and as we worked through this, it it was gone. And when she got up to leave, she said, "All the pain's gone." And I said, "Yeah, you just released you released the anger you held toward him, and you forgave him because it was his time. You forgave him, and now that's where the pain left. So that's what I see so many times. I I, I can't tell you the number of times it's happened in my office where we talk through something and they get up and the, the back doesn't hurt anymore. And I myself had a situation where I was driving from, oh, Michigan to Missouri and uh, I was could hardly breathe. I could, I was, had, the cold was so bad I could hardly breathe. <gasps> I was fighting for every breath, you know. And I kept, I went back and I was thinking about a, a conversation I had with someone and I realized that uh, I had a new realization about it, but I realized that I didn't have to take any of it personally, that she was just venting. And then even though she was targeting me at the time, and when I did that, the cold was gone. Interesting. It was completely gone. Mm-hmm. I'm completely gone. <laughs> and it was just shocking, but it was just completely gone because it, that, that uh, whatever triggered my unrest and my upset was gone because I forgave that. I let it go. It wasn't relative anymore, uh, relevant anymore, rather, and um, and it was gone. And so those kinds of things happen a lot. But mostly, what we do is go to the doctor, have the tumor cut out. But whatever was creating the tumor in the first place just returns because it's never been adjusted. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's such a shame because. There really is a big movement these in getting to the bottom of things, and I'm all for medical science. I think you ha- they have to include this part mm-hmm. about what what are you thinking or doing or saying or feeling? What are you holding on to that's contaminating your body? And I'll tell you what, it's really easy to see when we drive. You know, when we drive a car, it's like, oh, that person cut me off. No, for that moment. You just clenched up your whole body, and uh, you know you you compressed your organs, <laughs> and you created some toxins from your liver. You know, and so what if you did that every single day of your life? You know, can you imagine how much toxin you would create mm-hmm. <laughs> if you went through that kind of a phenomena every day of your life? And that gives you kind of a mini idea of of how dangerous it could be to live in a state of angst. Oh or, yes upset or anger or resentment or all of those things, you know. Mm -hmm. Swami Vivekananda, you quote, and his quote was, all power is within you. You can do anything and everything. Believe in that. Do not believe that you are weak. Do not believe that you're half crazy lunatics, as most of us do nowadays. You can Mm -hmm. do anything and everything without even the guidance of anyone. Stand up and express the divinity within you. One of Mm -hmm the exercises that you have mm-hmm. in your book deals with developing strong concentration yeah and it's using a candle and you say you, you you try to do this daily yourself because if your attention leaves the candle and you were to make a mark on a piece of paper noting mm-hmm. that you weren't doing the the concentration and then return your focus to the candle your your statement is does it sound easy why don't you try it and see what you think? Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So what made you aware of this exercise? Where did it come from? Is that what you said? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I did, took a course many years ago, and that's how we developed concentration. And uh, and it's so, so the Buddhists might do something different. They might look at a spot on the wall and just st- gaze at that spot for a, a number of minutes. But the point of it is, is that we, it's about mind training. We're actually training the mind to stay on a, on a point until we're finished with it. 
And so what most people do is they're, they're, they're multitasking, you know, and they, they're trying to think of four or five things at the same time. They're answering the phone, working on the computer, uh, writing something, you know, all these things at the same time. And then they don't even remember what they did that day because they were so scattered in their attention that they never really took in anything. So concentration is really important. I do readings, and if I hadn't, didn't have really strong concentration, I wouldn't be able to do that because that requires that you hold your attention on something until you're finished. Mm-hmm. But I think that's true with most kinds of work. To be really good at anything, you have to hold your attention on it until you're finished with it. The other part of it, though, is that it allows me to meditate in such a way that I can really go deep in the meditation and get the answers that I want. And I have a number of examples in the book of people that, you know, are so good at quieting their mind and going into a deep space that they get their answers and and they're able to be very creative and very uh, intuitive and just, you know, astounding and mentality, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, I did. If you, I did that exercise for around six months, and then, and then every day, and then um, it was amazing because people would, I would be doing something, and somebody would talk to me, and I couldn't, I didn't even hear them. Like, what, what are you, t- what are you talking to me, or what? And uh, and it was because I realized then that I was so concentrated on what I was doing that I had blocked them out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that was, for me, that was an awareness that said, it's working. You're getting stronger in your concentration. Yes, and it's a very good tool to have. It's It's a very good tool. There was a delightful story in your book, and it was about changing attitudes towards a person or situation. And I don't know of anybody that doesn't have judgment about something they see. I mean, this is a very normal human patterning. Every society in the world has it. But you presented a question. Can you remember a time when you changed your attitude towards a person or situation and everything turned out better than you expected? And you Mm -hmm. tell the story of a father with his son, who's 24 years old, and they're sitting on a train, and the son is just exclaiming about the trees that are going, you know, the train's going by the trees, and he makes all kinds of comments, and there's another couple that's near them that's observing this, and the couple Mm -hmm. thinks that the son, who, again, Mm -hmm. is 24, we're not talking about an 8-year-old, talking about a 24-year-old, and they think he's mentally ill. But I loved the way the story goes, and the father says, uh, oh, yes, and they said, do uh, do you take him to a doctor? Yes, I've done that, and we're now returning from the hospital. My son has been blind from birth, and he just got his eyes today. I love that story. Yeah, isn't that great? Isn't that great? There's another one. There's another one. I don't don't even know if it's in this book or not, but about a, a little girl who liked applesauce. And her dad and her went to the grocery store together, and they were going to get some applesauce. And um, and they, in the meantime, they, there was a little boy from school, and there was something, you know, he uh, he acted funny. He was maybe he was autistic or something. He was different, and she and she just sort of spurned him. And and uh, and his dad said, "What are you doing?" And he and because she's normally very friendly and everything. Oh, he's he's different. I I don't want to talk to him. And then they went to get the applesauce, and the can was dented. And he said, well, I don't think we should get this applesauce because the can's dented. And she said, well, the applesauce inside's okay. And he said, well, what about the little boy? Mm-hmm. And so it, I thought it was beautiful that he used the applesauce to teach her, and she caught it. She got it. She said, he, he, what's wrong? He's Everything inside of him is okay, too. And so we teach through those little situations. It's it's great, you Mm -hmm. know. It really is. It's very touching. And you have a segment in your book about drama. Oh, my goodness. We human (laughs) beings are so good at making drama. I know because I've done it myself. You know, I have to really be honest when I'm having these conversations with people like you because if we don't acknowledge that we've grown through lessons of our own learning oh my goodness you know people have to understand being human 
My goodness, we muck so much stuff up as we're going through life, and then we look back and say, oh, good Lord, especially when we're adolescents. Oy vey. Anyway, you look at these different things, and you just go, hey, I'm not trying to be superior to you, and that's not why we're sharing this information. It's because we need to empower you to understand that you've got more ability to Mm -hmm. make your life script work and you don't need to throw everything out into the recycle bin what you need to do (laughs) is to realize you've got so much inside of you whoever's listening to the show we want you gene and i both want you to know that you've got so much going for you yeah that you we we just want you to shine we want you to be able to look at life and say wow i'm so glad i'm here Yes, it's just so important. We can rewrite our stories, and you have a segment on that, and I know that we're just about out of time. Jean, you have a a website. It's spiritualtransformation.com, spiritualtransformation.com. You have something special that you're offering to people that listen to the show. Well, tonight we're talking about the book Deep Truth, Wisdom of the Masters, Mm -hmm. Reality and Illusion. And I'd like to, anybody who's interested and they'd like to know a little bit more, maybe maybe get a taste of it, I'd like to uh, offer them three free chapters of the book, and then they can kind of decide if that's something that they would like to pursue. But they would... All they have to do is actually contact me through my website. It would be gene at spiritual transformation is my email. And then once they contact me and let me know that they would like the three chapters, I will send that to them. And then they can have a little taste of this and and see if they're ready to embrace growth and jump in, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what it takes. It takes a willingness to say, let me explore. You become the adventurer, the adventurous, whichever way you want to call yourself. But more than that, you look at life as a gift. You look at life as an opportunity to really refine who you are. You've come in with gifts and talents, and you may say, oh, I don't have any. Well, I guarantee you, you do. I don't care what your status is in life. I don't care what part of the planet you're living on. You make a difference by being just who you are. That's why you're here. And when you know that, boy, you discover a power within yourself. And, Gene, your book is Deep Truth, Wisdom of the Masters, Reality and Illusion, Practical Steps to Understand the Universe, Master the Mind, Develop Intuition, Deepen Wisdom, and Live an Inspired rich life. Jean Walters, I want to thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate it, and it's been fun. Oh, it always is. I just love what I do, and I love having guests like you on the air, because the more we can empower other people, hey, the better this planet is going to be. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing, aren't we? Yes, we are. (laughs) You have a fabulous evening. Thank you. You too, Donna. Take care now. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Donna Sebo here. We are taking a break. Check out spiritualtransformation.com, and you can contact Gene directly if you choose to do so at Gene, J-E-A-N, at spiritualtransformation.com, 